you have a Bible this morning, turn with me to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. If you're new with us this morning, we've been doing a study through the New Testament book of Acts. It comes right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then we have Acts. And uh, we'll be looking at right about the midpoint of Acts chapter 19 this morning. It's interesting how often our society is fine with religion as long as religion does not overstep its bounds. Religion is fine, people say, kept in its place. And so the assumption sometimes is that there is the world of religion and then there is the real world of practical, no-nonsense living And we really need to keep those two things separate. Now we know that disciples of Christ have not always been content to divide up their lives along those lines. Now this becomes a bigger issue when power and politics are involved. So take the upcoming election for example. People say, well, faith is fine. But don't let it dictate how you vote. That could be dangerous. What about the separation of church and state? Obviously, many people in our society today disagree with that statement because, once again, faith is a major issue in this upcoming election. And then there are Christians who, for example, want to go to Cuba because the church is growing like wildfire in Cuba and desperately needs teaching and encouragement. But these Christians are being discouraged by the American government from going to Cuba because they don't want us pouring our American dollars into the Cuban economy. Religion is okay, they say, but American foreign policy is more important. Sometimes the issue is not politics or foreign policy, but money. For example, when William Wilberforce decided that the slavery trade, the slave trade, was an evil institution that needed to be abolished, people got real angry. The entire economy was based on the slave trade. And today, we know we have a similar issue. One of the reasons people get upset when we take a stand against abortion is the abortion industry generates a great deal of money for a lot of people. Once again, religion is fine, they say, but when it infringes upon the ability that I have to make a buck, it's gone too far. Well, this morning, we're going to see how it is that the gospel clashes with and ultimately overcomes the vested interests of society. In Acts chapter 19, Luke narrates for us how the gospel reached and affected an entire city and even its surrounding province through a relatively small group of believers. Remember, Ephesus was located in a very strategic place. It was known as the treasure house of Asia because it commanded all the trade into the river valley of the rich province of Asia Minor. Ephesus was a port city and a very prosperous center of trade and commerce. It was also the site of the temple of Artemis, sometimes called Diana. Uh, This was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It had 127 marble pillars inlaid with gold and rare gems. The temple was 425 feet long, 220 feet wide, and 60 feet high. Displayed inside the temple was the pride of Ephesus, the multi-breasted carved image of Artemis, which the Ephesians believe had actually fallen down from heaven. Artemis, by the way, was a fertility goddess, And because of that, ritual prostitution was practiced as a form of worship in the temple. The city, as we saw last week, was also a center of witchcraft. 
a kind of watering hole for magicians and those who practice sorcery and the black arts. So it was to this city that the Apostle Paul came. And there Paul and his friends, you might say, would assault the strongholds of evil and ultimately turn that city upside down. The question is, how did it happen? How did Paul and his friends tear down those strongholds in Ephesus? And we ask that question, of course, not just because we're history buffs, but because we want to learn how we can have the same kind of impact on our society today. Now, the first thing is something that we touched upon last week. I would like to call it persuasion. So if you're a note taker and you've got a thing there in your bulletin that you can take notes, just write down that word. That's, that's important. Persuasion. That's the first thing. So remember, we saw last week that as Paul came to Ephesus, he started by teaching in the synagogue. And then after three months, he could see that he was banging his head against the, the wall. So he rents out the lecture hall in the school of Tyrannus, where he would teach for five hours a day, presumably six days a week, for two years. By the way, if you add that up, conservatively, that amounts to over 3,000 hours of teaching and instruction. And actually, I think, it's, I think it's safe to say that the average university student does not get that much instruction in four years of college. So this is a lot of teaching that Paul is doing in the city of Ephesus. Luke says in verse 8 of chapter 19 that Paul was reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. And then in verse 10, Luke says he was reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And later in verse 26, when Demetrius, who would stand in opposition to Paul, paid him a great compliment as he confessed, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people saying that gods made of hands are no gods at all. Notice in all of those verses how that idea of reasoning and persuading is so prominent. Increasingly, People today in our society are realizing that persuasion has become a lost art. Uh, listen to what Matt Miller wrote. He, he wrote a column, a guest column in the New York Times. And this is a rather lengthy quote, so I don't like to normally do lengthy quotes because people tune out. But please don't tune out because this is a very insightful quote, okay? Okay. Here's what he says. He starts out and he asks the question, is persuasion dead? And he says, if so, does it matter? Is it possible in America today to convince anyone of anything he doesn't already believe? If so, are there enough places where this mingling of minds occurs to sustain a democracy? The signs are not good. 90% of political conversation amounts to dueling talking points. Best-selling books reinforce what folks thought when they bought them. Talk radio and opinion journals preach to the converted. Let's face it, the purpose of most political speech is not to persuade, but to win, be it power, ratings, celebrity, or even cash. By contrast, marshalling a case to persuade those who start from a different position, is a lost art. Honoring what's right on the other side's argument seems a superfluous thing that can only cause trouble. Politicos huddle with like-minded souls in opinion cocoons that seem impervious to facts. The politicians and the press didn't kill off persuasion intentionally, of course, it's more manslaughter than murder. Persuasion just isn't relevant to delivering elections or eyeballs. Polls have figured out that it, to get votes, you don't need to change minds. Even when they want to, modern media makes it hard. 
They give officials seconds to make their points, ignore their ideas in favor of their poll numbers, or showcase a class of caricatures, believing this is the only way to make debate entertaining. Elections may turn on emotions like hope and fear anyway, but with persuasions passing, there is no alternative. I think that's a very insightful commentary upon our society. And I have to tell you, I think he's right. And I have to tell you also that I don't bemoan this so much for what it does in the realm of politics, but for what it does in the realm of faith. Are people becoming Christians today simply because of emotion or because of reasoned and persuasive arguments? Does anyone care whether or not something is actually true or not? Or do we just care about what works and what makes us feel good because it works? Would Paul's method of careful reasoning and persuading have been viable today? Would anyone have listened to Paul for more than just a soundbite? And could this be why the faith of many in America today is a mile wide but an inch deep? And these are very good questions to ask. And I, for one, would like, us, like to see us pay more attention today to Paul's method of evangelism. I'd like to see us uh, as believers in university classrooms and high-tech boardrooms and backyard Bible studies actually reasoning and persuading people about the kingdom of God. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that Jesus Christ inaugurated a kingdom through his death and resurrection, conquering the powers of sin and death and the devil. And now he reigns from heaven over his people and will one day return to rule over a new heaven and a new earth. That's what we reason and persuade people about. That's what we try to do, to bring them from this position to that position. Not through just sound bites and emotion, but through reasoned and persuasive arguments. Persuasion. The second thing that takes place in a city like Ephesus or like our own comes as a direct result of the first. And the second thing is conversion. Conversion, so write that down if you're taking notes. That's the second thing. People in Ephesus put their faith in Christ, turning away from idols to the true and living God. We saw this last week as we saw a group of almost Christians, remember the disciples of John, come to a full knowledge of Christ. And we saw how they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And then we saw those who were formerly involved in witchcraft and magic and sorcery. Luke says in verse 18 that many of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices, speaking specifically of their magical practices. Many of them even brought their costly books. Remember, they were worth 50,000 pieces of silver. Remember, one piece of silver equals one day's wage. So, so figure out the math. That's a lot of money. And they put these books together and they burned them because they were filled with incantations and spells and, and all that kind of stuff. And this is visible and tangible proof of their repentance and of their turning to the true and living God. So if we're going to make an impact, it will start by simply, very simply, people being converted in this, in this transformative kind of way. But it would be foolish for us to think that the change that took place in their lives stopped there. Because this is only the beginning. There is also this thing called discipleship. That's the third thing I want you to write down. Discipleship. And, and this is all about following Jesus in day in and day out. So these new believers in Ephesus had only started on a journey. Uh, it wasn't just about burning up a few books 
They would also have to deal with things like selfishness and pride, greed and lust. I don't know about you, but I've found that those things don't burn up quite so easily, do they? I can burn up a few books, but I have a hard time burning up what's in my heart. And, and so that takes time. Uh, and, and then they would have to learn how to live out their faith in the midst of a pagan world, an idolatrous world. Uh, what will following Jesus mean for my job? Uh, how, will, how will it alter the kinds of things that I laugh about around the water cooler? What will following Jesus mean for my family? How will it change the way I treat my husband or wife? How will it change the way I parent? How will it change the way I spend my money? Those are all the questions of discipleship that all of us have to ask. And they had to ask it in Ephesus. So I can imagine in, in a home in Ephesus, it might go kind of like this. So one day, Mr. Aurelius is, is sitting in the family room and he's reading the Ephesian Post Tribune. And he calls to Mrs. Aurelius. She's in the kitchen. She's doing a little, a little cooking. And he says, honey, have you picked up Lydia's graduation present yet? I noticed on the way home that they're having a wonderful sale. You cannot find such quality statues of Artemis in all of Ephesus. Made of pure silver, I hear. 50% off, honey. <laughs> Mrs. Aurelius calls from the kitchen, honey, I've decided not to get her that this year for graduation. I've decided to get her a book. Mr. Aurelius says, a book? We can't get her a book. Everyone gets their child a statue of Artemis for graduation. 20 years ago, my parents gave me a statue of Artemis for graduation. That's what we do here. You can't get her a book. Mrs. Aurelius calls back, but honey, we no longer worship Artemis. Remember what Paul said? Remember how Paul taught us there in the school of Tyrannus? Remember how he taught us that there is one true and living God who is immortal and invisible? Remember how he told us that we serve the Lord Jesus and no other? Remember how he told us what Jesus said? Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say, I am, the one, I am one of the ways. He said, I am the way. Oh, but honey, what will the neighbors say? I, I, I mean, this is our way of life. This is how we do things. We can't turn our backs on everything. Aren't you going a little too far with this Jesus stuff, honey? And what if everyone did that? What would happen to our city? What would happen to our culture? What would happen to our economy? I mean, do you know how much money those little statues generate for our economy? I mean, my own brother works for the silversmiths. He could lose his job. Well, these are the kinds of conversations that people have when they become followers of Jesus Christ. These are the kinds of things that happen. These are the kinds of questions that you ask when you become a follower of Christ. They're not always easy, are they? Because Jesus called us to a life of not just conversion, but discipleship. Okay? And this brings us to the next thing, the fourth thing that happens when the gospel begins to take root, and that is opposition. So write that down, opposition. What Luke calls in verse 23, no small disturbance. I, I find that an interesting way of putting it. No small disturbance. So let's read, let's pick it up in verse 23 and see what Luke has to say. About that time, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who had made silver shrines, who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. And these he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. So let's just stop there for a moment. So it starts with the local union of silversmiths and their boss, Demetrius. Demetrius, of course, has noticed that receipts have been plummeting. And he begins to realize that this has happened ever since this guy named Paul started teaching in that school of Tyrannus a couple of years earlier. Uh, 
we know, of course, that, that people would come from all over Asia and they would buy these little statues of Artemis and then they would take them to the temple and they would offer them as a part of their worship. Sometimes they would just take them home and put them on their mantle as a souvenir of their visit to the great city of Ephesus. Now, it seems that more and more people were not buying these little statues. No, what are they buying? They're buying crosses. So they got crosses on their mantle instead of statues of Artemis. And business had never been worse for the silversmiths. So Demetrius is thinking, doggone it, I may have to lay off a few of my craftsmen here. What are we going to do? So he gets them all together to address this issue. So look what he says. His speech actually started in the, in the end of verse 25. He says, men, you know that our prosperity depends on this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. When they heard this, they were filled with rage and they began crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So now you can see here that this Demetrius is a smart guy. Because he starts out and he talks about the bottom line. And this really is what these craftsmen care about the most, right? They care about the bottom line. He knows that. And he does manage, if you'll notice, to mix in a little bit of religion and a little bit of civic pride in this whole thing. And they get real fired up and they begin to chant, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And then we're told that multitudes start pouring down the Arcadian Way. By the way, you can see from the photograph that the Arcadian Way is still there today. That's what it looks like today. So they started pouring in the, these silversmiths and they move down that Arcadian Way towards the big theater there that you can see. This was an amazing theater. I'm just curious, who's been to Ephesus? I know we've got people that, yeah, a few of you have been there. So you've seen this, right? You've, you've done this. You've done this walk. 25,000 people, that stadium. Well, that's pretty good. That's not as much as, you know, candlestick, but that's still a pretty good crowd for back then. So, so th this mob is just pouring down this Arcadian way. Um, they, they, probably, uh, uh, they probably couldn't find the Apostle Paul, but Luke tells us they swept up two of his friends and they, and they dragged them right into the theater. Let's look at what he says, verse 29. The city was filled with rage and with confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus. So these are two, two traveling, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let him. And some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. So then, some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. Some of the crowd concluding, concluded it was Alexander, since the Jews had put him forward, and having motioned with his hand, Alexander was intending to make a defense to the assembly but when they recognized that he was a Jew, a single outcry arose from them all as they shouted for about two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the mob is in a frenzy, totally beyond reason, chanting, confusion reigns. I think with a note of humor, Luke says that most of them, when it came right down to it, didn't even know why, why they were there. Have you ever been in a kind of a mob or seen a mob or a riot? And you realize that people will do things in a mob that they would never do as individuals. It's a very interesting thing. I went to a 49er game a couple of, a couple of we a few weeks ago on a Sunday night. And I got to tell you, it was a mob. It was like this. It was crazy. Fights broke out. I mean, people were chanting. My son and I... Uh, made the mistake of saying, you know, at halftime, you know, at halftime, what do you do at halftime? 
right? You don't watch the band. You get up and you go and get something to eat. So we thought, well, let's go get something to eat. So we got up and we went to get something to eat. We were absolutely in a, in a shoulder-to-shoulder drunken brawl when we got into the, into the thing where you go get something to eat. It was unbelievable. Confusion. Rain. People had Niner jerseys. People had Cleveland jerseys. Nobody seemed to care about the game. It was an absolute riot. We didn't get anything to eat. We just went back to our seats just for our lives. <laughs> it was absolutely crazy. We had a great time, but it was crazy. <laughs> but notice Paul. Paul wants to get in the mix. Paul wants to rescue his friends. But the Christians in Ephesus... Say, no way, Paul, you're not going in there. They will eat you alive. And and so even the Asiarchs, who, by the way, were kind of the nobility of the city, urged Paul not to venture into the crowd. It's interesting that Paul had made friends with these Asiarchs because these guys, one of their jobs was to promote the worship of the Roman emperor. That's part of what the Asiarchs did. As a matter of fact, one of them each year was voted as sort of the the high priest of emperor worship. We don't know if they had become Christians or not, but somehow Paul had made inroads into this group of people. He had made friends with some of the mucky mucks, some of the VIPs of that city. And they are looking out for Paul. Notice also that a Jew named Alexander is put forward. Now, The reason for this is that the Jews of Ephesus, not the Christians, but the Jews would have wanted to disassociate themselves from the Christians. Because remember, the Jews didn't worship idols either, right? So they would say, you know what, they're going to lump all of us together. And we're going to just be lumped together with the Christians. So Alexander, you go tell them, we're not Christians. We're different from Christians. Alexander stands up, he motions with his hand, and he thinks that he's going to get everybody to be quiet and listen. And as soon as they see him and they think, oh, he's a Jew, he's against Artemis too. And that fires him up even more. And so for two hours, they're shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Absolute pandemonium. But this is what happens when the gospel makes inroads into an idolatrous culture through even a minority of believers who have been persuaded that the gospel is true and they seek to live that out in everyday discipleship. Sooner or later, there will be a rub. Sooner or later, there will be a clashing of values. Uh, Maybe a good example would help right now. Christmas. So we just got done with this holiday. And it's good to reflect on it. You know, we talk about it beforehand, but it's good sometimes to look back and think a little bit about it. I mean, this holiday where supposedly we celebrate the birth of Christ, but we we all know that for most people in our society, it's nothing more than an idolatrous celebration of materialism. Let's face it. Let's call it what it is. Uh, We all know how much our retail economy depends upon Christmas. So what would happen? if followers of Christ all over the country decided to change, at least change, our spending practices at Christmas to be more in line with the priorities of the gospel? What would happen? Or what would happen if ordinary believers decided to stop watching certain TV programs and going to certain movies? What would happen? Uh, Unfortunately, though, most people in America, honestly... The, 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 the polls show this. Most people in America see, who claim to be Christians see very little connection between their faith and the actual choices they make in the public square. No connection at all. And, and I would say if we do not see this clash of values anywhere in our lives, then we have ceased to be salt and light in the world. So the fifth thing, the fifth word, uh, and the fifth thing I want you to see in this passage is what I call vindication. Vindication. Sometimes God steps in and vindicates his people. And in Ephesus, this would come in the most unusual of ways. It came through the town clerk. The town clerk was the executive officer of the civic assembly. He acted as a liaison between the civic assembly 
government of Ephesus and the Romans who really controlled the whole deal. And he had a vested interest because the Romans would hold him responsible for the riot. And they could, they could bring severe penalties upon the city of Ephesus if things got out of hand. Somehow, the town clerk is able to quiet the crowd down long enough to talk some sense into them. So let's see what he says in verse 35. And after quieting the crowd, the town clerk said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there, after all, who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from heaven? So now, these are undeniable facts. You ought to keep calm and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of our goddess. So then, if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with them have a complaint against any man, the courts are in session and the proconsuls are available, let them bring charges against one another. But if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in the lawful assembly. For indeed, we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's events, since there is no real cause for it. And in this connection, we will be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. After saying this, he dismissed the assembly. So I want you to notice that this wise town clerk says, basically makes three points to this mob. Uh, his first point is they ought to keep calm and do nothing rash, because, listen, everyone knows that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of Artemis. Everyone knows she fell down from heaven. In other words, what he's saying, listen, guys, we don't need to get overly excited uh, about this. Because, you know what, Artemis' fame is universally acknowledged. It's going to take a lot more than a few renegade Jews to bring her down. That's what he's saying. It may not be true. But it, 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 was, it, was, it, it worked. <laughs> so don't worry, guys. You know, Artemis is so great. She's not threatened by this little band of, of people. His second point is very interesting and very instructive for us. He says that these Christians are neither robbers of temples or blasphemers of Artemis. So now he actually defends Paul and his friends. This is very revealing. Because it tells us that Paul had not directly denunciated Artemis in a smear campaign. It seems rather that his way was to simply teach the truth of the gospel. And let people put two and two together. And figure out what all of this meant in relationship to idols. It's like Paul lit a fuse. And just kind of let it burn, right? Until finally people figured out what it meant and then the bomb went off. Okay? That's, that's how he did it. Paul did not circulate a petition to rid the city of idol worship. He didn't form a mass rally or million man march to show their strength. He didn't put an ad in the paper telling everybody that Artemis was a fraud. What did he do? We already saw what he did. He sat down day after day after day in the school of Tyrannus and he reasoned and he persuaded people about the kingdom of God. And people got it. And it changed them. And then his third point is that if Demetrius wants to bring a charge against them, he ought to just use the proper legal channels. As a matter of fact, they themselves are in danger of being accused of a riot by the Roman authorities without any real justification. In other words, listen, guys, Paul's not the one breaking the law. You're the ones breaking the law. So we need to stop this. And no doubt, one of the things Luke wants to show his readers, remember Luke wrote this much later, right? Reflecting on all this. And Luke has a purpose in this. Now, one of the things you got to know is when Luke wrote this, Paul was sitting in a Roman prison. One of the things Luke wants to show his readers is that Christianity is not really a threat to the Roman Empire. And that, and that Christians are good citizens. Right? And so he's showing here from this story that these Christians were really not the problem. They were just going about their business, living out their lives, living out their faith. 
That's all. The problem is with this mob. And that's part of what Luke is trying to get across to these people. And so it's, an, it's a wonderful story because you'll notice how these believers never have to say a word through the whole thing. Yet in the end, they're vindicated by the leader of the very people who are trying to harm them. And we know that God does not always bring about such a calm result. Sometimes, and we've seen this right here in the book of Acts, God allows his people to undergo imprisonment or beating or even death. Yet here the storm dies down and everyone goes home. And that's the end of the story. But I want you to see how it is that the gospel clashes and ultimately overcomes the vested interests of society. I want you to see from this story how the strongholds of evil can be assaulted and ultimately can bring real change into a city. How did it happen? How did Paul and his friends tear down these strongholds? Please understand it did not happen through a campaign of negativity, through a, through a kind of denunciatory posture, but it happened by persuasion. It happens today as people come to faith in Christ and they begin to put their faith into practice in a life of discipleship. And this in turn will cause, from time to time, no small disturbance. Let me just give you one story to illustrate how change can happen even in a society, even in a country where evil had a terrible hold. Jackson Senyonga is now the pastor of a 40,000 member church called the Christian Life Church in Kampala, Uganda. His father was murdered by Idi Amin. He grew up during Idi Amin's reign in the, in the 70s. And Jackson, during that time, was literally, as a small baby, small child, was thrown into a garbage dump to die. Actually, he was three months old. He was raised by relatives. He came into a relationship with Jesus Christ at age 14. A few years later, he started a church in the slums of Kampala with six other people. In two weeks, two weeks, there were 2,000 people attending that church. And that was 21 years ago. Jackson now leads 600 pastors and leaders in the city of Kampala and coordinates prayer throughout the nation. Just to share a little bit about what has happened in Uganda through not just this ministry, but the ministry of, of others as well. But listen to this. The crime rate has dropped 70%. AIDS has dropped from 33.3% to 5%. Prayers have been instituted in all levels of society, including government, business, and of course churches. Laws are actually being rewritten in favor of the principles of Scripture. The First Lady prays publicly and encourages all sectors of government to hold morning and lunchtime prayer meetings. All the members of the Parliament meet weekly for prayer. All that did not happen, you see, because of some kind of political revolution or through Christians staging mass rallies or signing petitions. It didn't happen through the negative denunciation of personal sin or institutional evil but rather through the gospel, changing people's lives from the inside out. People who understand that you cannot separate your faith from, from anything. You can't separate your faith from the way you vote. You can't separate your faith from what you spend your money on. You can't separate your faith from what you do for fun. And you can't separate your faith from any aspect of your life. So your personal and your public life are one, you see? The fact is faith does n that does not impact every aspect of our life is really not faith at all. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this uh, challenging story. We thank you, God, for uh, this, this example and model of how you turned a city upside down. We thank you for the privilege that we have of being salt and light in this society.
And Father, I pray for each and every one of us that you would help us to think through what it means for us to live for you in the midst of this society that we live in. God, we are, we are not so foolish so as to think that there are not idols in our society. And Lord, we pray that we can live in such a way that would display the wonders of knowing the true and living God who loves us so much that you would send your son to die for us on the cross. We thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to learn more about developing a closer relationship with God and his son, Jesus Christ, please feel free to call us at 650-349-1132. Drop us an email at info at cpcfc.org.